Welcome everyone to Rules Explain. In this episode, we are going over the game Catan. And this might be our last episode with us. I think we're almost done with the rules, but I'm John Merritt. I'm Rob Nothing. And let's get started. Uh, in our last episode, we finished up with the actual rules, uh, which are just five pages long. And in fact, you know, the first part of the rules has to go to the last page for a summary. And then after you read the summary, you can go back and read the actual rules. Uh, but they did add in a really cool almanac in which you can look up different aspects of the game. So that way in the rules, when they talk about it, they don't repeat themselves over and over and over again. So in this episode, we're just going to, we're just going to go over the almanac, maybe talk about the history of the game a bit and, uh, just really the influence that this one game has had on a whole industry. So here's the almanac, you know, it's, Got building, building cost cards. Rob, you got anything? Well, the, the essential nature of the almanac is you just go ahead and make it possible for you to find a, any rules by just looking it up alphabetical. And I kind of wish every game would do this. If this is you really think nice. about, like, for example, Warhammer 40K, a game that we reviewed in an earlier season, um, I understand how difficult that would be to put the rules alphabetically. But it would not be impossible. I mean, even indices. I mean, if you have an index and it tells you this rule is on this page, you're still flipping all over the bloody place trying to find something. This almanac is is genius. I mean, it is it is just going to make playing the game so much more relaxing. You know, you're not going to be getting into arguments about you know what the rule is and then continue to argue while you try to find the ruling. It's right there alphabetical. It's right there for you. Yeah, it is nice. And I mean, with Warhammer 40,000, oh my gosh, on some of the additions, it was go to the core rule, go look in the codex, go look in the fact, but that referred something back to this other, and you, you know, you had four or five different books just for one army. It was just, I drove me mad. I think but yes. the future of gaming is, is, and what's funny is we say the future of gaming and we have to go back to the past. And this isn't that far in the past. I mean, you know, we're talking, you know, just 25 years, which maybe to some in our audiences, their lifetime, but for people like you and I, that represents half a lifetime at this point. And for really old <laughs> organizers out there, it's one third of a lifetime. But anyway, yeah. to make a long story very much shorter, I mean, the, this game, you know, has, has kind of set the tone and should be setting the tone for game design in the future. And you know, just the idea of making things that are easy to play or require lots of thought and have repeat, lots of repeatable gameplay. That's what everybody keeps talking about. What's the replay value of a game? How often can I play this game? Which is just immense amount of replay as options are available with this game. Yeah, and that's a really good point because uh, in Germany, when you made this, you know, board gaming over in Germany, as you know, is just, well, actually just in Europe in general, is huge, way bigger huge. over there than it is in, in the United States. So when he put that, when he put this out in 1995, it won a Game of the Year award over in Germany. I mean, that's where the award-winning rules come into play. And I mean, he he, he won five different awards in 1995 uh, for this game. Yeah. Uh, one of the things he used to do was he used to. Uh, it took him three years to to develop the rules or this game. And he used to play the game with his son. And every time he noticed his son would get distracted or do something else or become disengaged, he would make a note of it. So now he can go back and refine the game, which is why this game is so just engaging all the time. It's not like Monopoly where you roll the dice, you know, you do your play and then you sit and wait. You know, you're constantly having to pay attention to what's going on. And more games need to have that type of, of interaction, much like, you know, the role playing games where everybody can be involved at almost any time. We, we need to go ahead and, and remind ourselves that gameplay should be about game play not game weight yes exactly and in fact with this game uh what generally happened with board games is they would come out they would get a huge spike in sales and then they would drop off they would like almost plummet to nothing because people were done with it and they moved on to something else this game dropped off but it remained consistent people were still buying the game uh, when it came over to america um, it did not get the distribution that it needed, and it was almost a flop. In fact, the, dis the, the distribution company over here almost went out of business until another company came in, bought them, found this game, and like really got it out there, and this game just exploded in the, in the United States. 
And in fact, in 2015, this game won the GamesCon Vegas Game of the Century. I mean, this is, I, I underestimated this game. I, I will be the first to admit, uh, when I played the game, I found it very engaging. Um, you know, it's, it's a game to, to, to play. You know, I found myself wanting to play it again. And that is the key to success in any game. If you feel like you want to keep playing it over and over again, and, and here's what's going to sound funny. When you get done playing Catan, you don't feel, um, you don't feel like there's a, a, an aftertaste. You know, uh, unlike other games where you play and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do this game for a while because that was just too much. I had to do too many things. Like sometimes, and I'm not disrespecting Draining. Warhammer, but you know, if you play Warhammer 40K, you're kind of like, okay, I, I just want to set this aside for a while and I'll come back and play it again later on. Catan oh, yeah, is yeah. not like that. You can play that game almost nightly and, and you would not feel that you have gotten enough of it. When I play a game and I get done with it, win or lose, and I come back to it and I say, I, you know, I could have done better if I had done this or if I had done that, then that makes me want to come back and play the game. Not, boy, I wish I'd rolled my dice better. You know, but if my strategy had been different, maybe I would have gotten a different result. Right. And this game is really good at that. You know, do I want to play my night cards? Do I want to go development? Do I want to go build along roads? You know, which direction do you want to go? Well, that's why I found our gameplay when we were playing it just a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And you were doing very well. You were able to collect a lot of different resources. And suddenly you noticed I was buying just development cards because I realized I was never going to catch up with you with traditional buildings. So I did everything I could to just get development cards and try to get my victory points through those. So the game's vectors to victory. Well, that's an interesting phrase. Vectors to victory. <laughs> A but trademark. The games, yeah, the trademark. Actually, I'm going <laughs> to trademark game weight as well. So nobody can use game weight or or vector to victory. So there you go. You got to pay rules explained for the rights to say those things. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, that, that those vectors to victory are, are quite are quite numerous in, in this game and, and can take you in different directions, which is, again, what makes the gameplay so fascinating. It is nice. It's like, here's marine trade you know it talks about the number tokens the resource production now this is something new that no one had really ever done before uh in any real past games you know so i've been like a chess style type game i you know i move you move you know i lose pieces here you're actually producing stuff every single turn i will i will argue with you just slightly on that point because uh -huh. monopoly like games are resource management in a in a sense and there's probably people who are going to listen to this and perhaps argue and i hope they do i would like to go ahead and have them argue about this mm -hmm. but i mean monopoly is resource management in the sense that you're collecting money and you have to go ahead and save money and the, your properties can be turned into resources you That's gotta build and so on and so forth so it's not the first resource type game but it was unique in the sense of the types of resources and the ways that you could use resources for example, you're not building roads in Monopoly. You know, you're building either houses or hotels, and that's basically it. But mm -hmm. there's there's a little bit more options for you to do in in Catan versus Monopoly. Oh yeah, Monopoly is a, a, another interesting game. I mean, that they hold you know tournaments on this. There are tournament rules for people who just, who have you know whole strategies behind that game. Yes, that's a that's a, another huge game. Uh, see, there's the paths and the resource cards. Resource trade talks about the roads, the robber. The robber is an interesting one. I don't know why he put that in. I guess you know as another strategy of being able to block your your opponents. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think that's if really. If you don't slick. have, if you don't have the robber, this is this is strictly a game in which there the the limited interaction you have is basically trading, and there would be no trading if you are at the, the end game. The end game is you're, you're trying to just hoard your resources, prevent the other players from getting resources they need to win. And without the robber, it becomes almost a stalemate in some regards. And I can just imagine in that story you told earlier that at some point during the game, his son, you know, open up that book. He says, what can I do to get him interested? Well, how about I have mm -hmm. another piece on there that can disrupt this whole process of resource production and building and so on and so forth. So hence the robber. 
Yeah, I mean, with economies, you know, and with a few of the video games I've seen, uh, you know, you put money into an economy, you have to take money out of an economy. You know, if this game is producing stuff, you have to take away the production at some point, whether it's purchased or, in this case, robbed, you know. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, yeah, it's really slick. So that's rolling a seven, and then you got your settlements. And what's so fascinating about that is because seven is one of the more common numbers, at the end of the game, that robber tends to be a very, a very obvious as well as a very direct way that you can go ahead and curtail your opponent from being able to seize that victory, that last one or two victory points that he or she might need. It's, 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 it's quite interesting. So this is a neat page. I, I didn't see this the first time through where they have, you know, the a setup phase. You know, here's how the game is a set up. Round one. You know, each player rolls both dice. The players uh, with the highest starts first. Where did I read? Was that in this edition of the rules? It was like the oldest player gets to go first or something like that. It was something weird. <laughs> yeah, that tends to be um, an interesting an interesting way to get the first player. I mean, I, I have a game that the first player who goes is the player who read a book last. And oh. it's, it's very, there's just variations on on how you go ahead and get the first player. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, and then they talk about round two and what to do and this setup variable. Uh, here's some example tactics. Oh, the soldiers, soldier card. Some earlier editions of Catan had soldier cards. These are now called knight cards. Ah, okay. So yeah, the, 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 the rules we went over are actually the fifth edition rules. So it looks like in older edition, they had, yeah, it wasn't knight cards, they were soldier cards. Yeah, when I first bought the game, there were soldier cards. And the only thing I can speculate, and this is all speculation, is that um, with soldiers, you would imply that there could be some sort of conflict between the settlements. With knights, you imply that they are there to protect, which is what their hmm. main function is, is to go ahead and protect you and, and chase away the robber, essentially. Which brings me to a point. Um, one of the things I like to point out is possible variants that you could go ahead and do in games to make them, you know, a little bit different, just to go ahead and increase the the variance on gameplay and to go ahead and perhaps just throw a little curveball at people when they're expecting you to play a regular game. And one of those is to go back to the old day and call these things soldiers and maybe imp implement kind of a risk mashup where you go ahead and allow your armies to be on the board and you get to maneuver them and perhaps even try to, you know, either raise other people's settlements or perhaps just at least take them over. An extreme, That'd be kind of cool. An extreme perversion of the intent and purpose of this game, but it might be very different if you want to go ahead and try something like that or in a situation where you did not want to keep your friends for too long. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is just a game. Yeah, I mean, now, do you have any house rules that you use with this game? Uh, you know, you mentioned a variance, and I know you, you like to edit games some. I love to edit just about anything I do with role, with role-playing games, board games, whatever. I like to go ahead and try to to, uh, to stretch it and see how far you can do it before you just basically broken it and created a whole new game. With Catan, uh -huh. it, it was Catan that's a little bit of an exception. Um, wow. There haven't been the yeah, there haven't been very many ways that I've actually besides just crazy silly ideas, but nothing I've wanted to go ahead and say this is now going to be a rule that you have to use every time you play in in our games. One very interesting house rule that is not written, but it is well. Let me rephrase that. You do see this written in some uh, in some variants, uh, which is basically the rule that states that in the first. You, unless, well, actually, it works like this. Unless every player has five or more victory points, you can't place the robber on somebody else's territory. you got to try to move it to a neutral space or maybe to the desert or whatever the case may be. So that mm -hmm. way everybody has a chance to go ahead and, and build up their settlements and to go ahead and, and move forward. Because if you play a cutthroat game like at a tournament or whatever, which this is what happens in tournaments, but it's, it's a tournament. That's why they call it a tournament. You can right. go ahead and get control of that robber and just start really messing with people from the get-go. And it, it could turn into nothing more than just, you know, where the robber's going, who gets the lucky die roll of seven, or who has the most night cards. 
So that's mm -hmm. an interesting house variant that we've played with that has become kind of an official quote unquote variant as far as, you know, when you actually go ahead and, and are able to start sicking the Fritz, as they used to say, um, on, onto, onto other players. So there's the victory points, talks about trading, the victory point cards. Yeah, and then kind of moves into the Almanac Index, where you can quickly find what you need. And they got the credits. Uh, Klaus, I believe he's still alive. As you see, this yeah. is the fifth edition set of the rules. Um, his development team, looks like he's got, um, was, looks like he's got one family member, uh, Benjamin. I wonder if that's his son. <laughs> And Guido, oh, Guido, Guido. So yes, it's it's a good family friend. Maybe that was a couple of those kids that he uh, mentioned was just, you know, Quite possible. looking at the game and reading the books and gave him his his inspiration on how to keep the gameplay fresh and involved for everyone. Yeah, fantastic game. We highly recommend it. Um, Rob, do you have anything else? No, it's just you know keep going ahead and. And, and trying to go and look at different ways to play, different ways to go ahead and 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 enjoy and engage with other people. I just think we are living in an age of, of, of needing to interact, and this is one very, very positive way to interact. So, yes, yeah, so I highly recommend this game. One thing we did notice, because uh, I went to the website and, and, and looked at it, you know, this game is not, it, it's kind of standing still, but the technology surrounding it isn't. I think it's very, very cool that they're adding in a VR, uh, a virtual yep. reality game of this, where you put on a headset and you're sitting in a room and you've got the board in front of you and you play it. And I think that is just the cat's meow. I think that's so cool. <laughs> I just uh, love to see that because that's what it's all about is interacting with other people, mm -hmm. having fun and making those c connections. Absolutely. So guys, I think that's gonna do it for us. Um, I want to thank Ethan Peebles for the music. It does a fantastic job on it. You can find us on uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, we're on Spotify. Find us on YouTube, uh, Rules Explained. You can always email us at rulesexplained.gmail.com. Uh, I'm John Merritt. I'm Rob Nelson. Guys, thank you for listening. Adios. <laughs>